Well, as Dan already mentioned, the original, original name of this talk was uh, functional programming is bullshit. Which I don't meant, you know, well, I, I don't meant it this way, right? It, it was this kind of negative marketing that kind of hits you, you know, that hits you. It was, you know, if you don't, if, if you know functional programming, you say, you, know, kind of, you see it and kind of, you know, think, yeah, sure. I, I will, you know, I, I, I will see what he's, what he's talking about. And, and, you know, the first, first mail that I, that I get, you know, get, get from him, kind of, you know, uh, uh, confirmed that I, I was right. But anyway, uh, but now, yes. In this, in this, you know, in this, in this, this talk, I, I want to talk about about two topics that are very close to my heart, and this is functional programming and hardware, right? Because, you know, we kind of like functional programming. It, you know, give, give us some sort of guarantee, some sort of you know, some sort of assurances, some sort of you know, kind of composability and other kind of high-level concerns, but. It's still run on you know tiny slabs of hot silicon, which is this kind of you know it's kind of two worlds that not necessarily kind of mix together very 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 well, right? And we cannot really you know in many cases we can really pretend that this this, this part of the equation doesn't exist, right? It, we just you know we just say okay we have lambdas and this is all right. We have this kind of ni nice language that is, that is derived from <coughs> logic, and you, you don't you don't have to worry about you know some memory and whatever and. And you know CPUs and cycles and you know whatever instruction sets is this you know, stuff like that. It's already abstracted away. But you know I <coughs> I think that sometimes we should. You know, sometimes we should be kind of you know we shouldn't act. We just think. We should just think, which is you know quote from Slavojevic. I can't believe I actually did, did this. But anyway. Um, what I kind of feel, the kind of this, this idea that kind of filtered through internet is this, this, is this invocation of functional programming, right? That you have some problems, and the only, uh, only thing you need to do is to say the words functional programming, and everything is better, right? Your code is composable, testable, deployable, uh, anything able, and you know, there are, there are unicorns grazing on your lawn, everything fine, right? Just this kind of, this kind of almost this kind of second hand enlightenment. Somebody says say, say something along the way. A is great because, right? But people remember the first bit. A is great. You know how else you can explain popularity of MongoDB, right? It's not a very good, good database, but it kind of you know somebody said it's web scale and people b believe in this kind of stuff. You know this kind of kind of this, <coughs> this idea that the kind of I feel I don't have some em empirical data to s support my my kind of wild assumptions. Is this you know this kind of <coughs> The only thing we need to do is to have more functional programming, right? Only thing we have more functional programming, everything will be better, right? Implicitly, is this kind of it's almost like history has its, has its own you know, direction, is determined. Basically, we need more of it, and we will be better, right? But you know, this, this is this is not necessarily true. We kind of should use this kind of kind of stuff and kind of know where to apply it and how to apply it, and you know, kind of guide our own, own, own future, right? Because there was this idea that we need only, you know, in in kind of <coughs> not in programming language, programming world, but in, in in society, there was the idea that we need more internet, we need more more networks, we need more communication, we need more blocks, and everything will be better, right? The future, <coughs> you know, we 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 will have more free society, more more, more democracy, right? It was this idea like like uh, what was it? Gilmore said that you know, uh, internet treats censorship as as kind of error and routes around it, right? It was the same same idea. We need more of it, and everything will be implicitly better. But then, you know, came Edward Snowden, and we kind of realized, ah, it may be, it may be not that simple, right? That because we have it doesn't mean you know somebody else doesn't use it for different purposes. We have to kind of shape this this, this future. Uh, same same thing here, right? That because you know because we have more of these languages and more kind of you know tools and stuff like that. Maybe maybe I'm not saying I'm, I'm not saying it's it's you know. It's, it's bullshit, but maybe it's not the best way to go. And this is a, a, a very similar idea, very similar kind of vibe or, or feeling was, was describing Hunter S. Thompson in his book Fear and Loading in, La <coughs> Fear and Loading in Las Vegas. He was, he was basically kind of do, 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 was doing this kind of summary of 60s, right? summary of this you know, hippie movement and drug craze. And he was using very similar, similar, similar language, right? He was, he was basically using that no matter what we are doing, we are right, we are winning, or energy we simply prevail. Something like something along those lines. This is you know the same thing. You need only more of it, and everything will happen. And I mentioned this. I mentioned Hunter S. Thompson because from, from his from his book, I, I, 
basically borrowed, borrowed the name of, name of this talk. It's very very grim. Because in in the end, it's it's about you know it's about the you know trade-offs. You trade something for something else. Like you know this this old German folk tale about Faust. You know it was like he he struck deal with the devil, and he agreed that in afterlife he will serving to Mephistopheles, in ret uh, and in return he gets something like you know youth and wisdom and love of women, something like that. You know he trade something for something else. You know. But you know, <coughs> I think it's important to kind of uh, know whether or not this trade-off is worth it, right? You know, basically, you know, the, all, all these kind of programming trade-offs are basically, you're, you're trading something for performance, basically, you know, just, or, or control the performance, right? You just, okay, I don't want, I don't want to worry, worry about allocation, I just kind of, you know, Java, Java does it. I don't want to worry about whatever, you know, instruction scheduling, you know, GCC does it, stuff like that. Or I don't want to worry about, I don't know, any kind of idea that my program can be structured around some sort of predefined types and use like PHP probably. And <clears throat> this idea, you know, it's this idea, whether it's worth it, right? Basically trade something for something else, right? Somebody said, okay, yeah, I trade, I use this list language which is not in know, top notch, but we get uh, productivity. It seems like a good idea, but you know, how much you gain, how much you lose. This is this kind of the important bit, right? Because if you don't have a number, then you know this is kind of you know this is belief. You say, okay, I have more productivity. How much? I don't know. How much do you lose? I don't even, you know, I don't, cannot even comprehend it. So, you know, it's this kind of, you know, it's kind of good point. But problem is this, that these, these two quantities are not in the, on, on the same kind of, you know, you, doesn't have some same units. You know, it's like, you know, one unit is, you know, meters and kilograms, right? You cannot, cannot fold it together. So what I'm kind of proposing is to know what is possible on current hardware, right? It's kind of, have, have this kind of upper bound that you, you know, echo. I can do this thing this fast, right? And everything else kind of compared against this, this kind of uh, quantity that acts like speed of light. The speed of light is basically finite. You know, cannot get, go faster than this, right? But you can measure everything compared to it. You know, for, for example, there was, there was one article I was reading uh, I don't know, two years ago probably. It was, it was about some, you know, some guy basically had some data and decided to do some recommendation system, right? And he, he you basically using ACA actors create this system that com, uh, com, uh, that were computing similarity of users, right? He has some users, some number of users, and he creates a system that is actors, and one actors load the data from database, second kind of actors transform this data, and another kind of actors, you know, uh, was doing the, the computation itself, right? The, the similarity measures, whatever it was like. You know, Pearson and, and stuff, stuff like that. And he basically concluded on this amount, this amount of data, it was running 15 minutes, right? And the, this remark that, you know, but if you want more, you know, more data, you know, process more data or do it more quickly, you can do it, uh, you know, you can throw more hardware at it. It was, it was, it was, it was using ACA, which is scalable, you know, we can do, you know, add more cores, more sockets, even more nodes because, you know, it's, you know, transparent, whatever it's called, clustering, whatever. And, it, you know, what, what he was saying was true, generally speaking. But this problem shouldn't be running 15 minutes, it should be running 15 seconds. <laughs> because if, if I like look at this code, there was everything, everything that he does was so blatant inefficient. He was using, you know, as, as a good kind of, you know, functional fundamentalist, he was using, you know, vectors and immutable maps and stuff like that. And it, it had so, so much overhead that this problem was basically two orders of magnitude slower. And if he does it basically very simply, one thread, you know, just a couple of mutable buffers, shove it in, into them and compute it in you know, kind of one efficient uh, routine. It, it, it would take you know, 15 seconds. Even, even, maybe even less, you know, there are techniques how to do it. Right? And you know, it's kind of hard to know, you know, hard to know, is, is, it, is it too much, is it too little? And there's one, kind of one technique that I kind of occasionally use, and it's basically counting cycles, right? This, you know, I have some problems, it runs whatever number of seconds, minutes, just multiplied by my clock, clock, you know, clock rate of my CPU, or, or you know, uh, or and multiplied by number of cores that I'm running it, then I'm divided by uh, problem size and have a you know, number that say, you know, on one kind of iteration, this took this many cycles. Right? Is it mu is it too much? Is it too little? And we have, so, we have you get some sort of you know, some sort of idea how how, how fast or slow it is, right? But you have to know something about hardware. Because hardware act really, really weird. 
By the way, the, the, those slides, they are on my blog, Funktionalien says that. If you want to follow the, the, those links, then, you know, go there and don't download the slides. <clears throat> For example, sometimes linear search is faster than binary search, right? Which is kind of, kind of, kind of intuitive. This is just binary search do log, log, log and operations. Linear search basically, you know, they do linear time of work. And should be fa you know, binary search should be faster, but sometimes it isn't. If this array is small, then you know, this stuck on, you know, running ahead and just you know, hope for the best is is faster. You know, it's like you know, arrays up to 50 elements, for example. It, you know, it was 2010, so it might be different. It might be very different, right? You know, your command line tools can be faster than your Hadoop cluster, you know, obviously, because you know, again, you know, you can parallelize it on your, on, your, on your command line and have it overheads and stuff like that. Uh, this, this one is beautiful. Basically, point, point of this article is this, that sometimes this, this guy was doing processing, processing of graphs, and sometimes it is faster to sort this data and then access them, then access them in the kind of or, original order. I, I, I'm not talking about, you know, sort it in once and for all, and then, you know, access it, you know, many times, no. But every, uh, online, before every query, sort it, and do, do this access times, right? This is kind of, doesn't like, make, make sense, because, you know, accessing time is, you know, constant stuff, and, you know, just accessing them, you add in stuff, you know, constant and sorting is and log n, right? It just should be slower. But in this case, he was using radix sort, which is really, really fast. And it turns out that on, on current hardware, this is faster. This is faster, like, much, much faster. You know, and this, 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 this article has some sort of interesting link about sorting and joining and databases. And, and it's, it's, you know, generally speaking, liter liter literature about, about sorting is hilarious. This, 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 it's, you know, it's the kind of way that, because, okay, there are algorithms, there are pixels, there are this, this sort, and just make it fast. And they basically sit there, you know, until they, their numbers are better than every, everybody else's number. Every, uh, everybody else's numbers. This one. Yeah, you know, and it, for, you know, for, 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 one interesting thing is that, you know, he was using Radix sort. Radix sort was, was invented in 1887, 128 years ago. And it's still the fastest sorting algorithm out there, which is, you know, ironic. Uh, well, this, this is also also article. This is kind of interesting. This guy, Frank McSherry, was testing, was looking at numbers uh, published published numbers uh, about this kind of distributed uh, engines like Spark or, or GraphLab, Graph whatever, GraphX. And there was some kind of results of some algorithms, some problems like PageRank and graph reachability and stuff like that. Look at these numbers and kind of thought, oh, this doesn't look so good. Maybe what you know? How fast could you know, how fast would a you know, single thread nice implementation would be? And he beat them. He beat them by a big margin. And it was interesting, right? This was some uh, this is graphic ability running on Spark, 128, 128 cores, like half an hour. It was his algorithms, single core. Two and a half minutes, and this better algorithm. This is actually meant for this problem, not some, you know. You know, this is what I'm talking. You know, if, if you compare it to this, this thing, extreme and stuff like that, it's kind of better. But this is, you know, this is the, this, this is the stuff, right? And, and this article, this article proposes this this thing called, called cost, which is acronym for something, something like I don't know, something scalability and whatever. And this is this kind of metric. At which point? Parallel implementation is faster than single threaded implementation, right? Because you just kind of assume that, okay, this, this parallel has some overheads, so, so it's lower than the single, single thread implementation, but eventually it's, it's, it's faster, right? And then the cost means this, this kind of this point, like, you know, how much parallelism you need to actually beat single thread implementation. And his, his results are that sometimes this never happens, that you cannot beat single thread implementation, right? This is kind of counterintuitive. Just, you, you know, it should be, you know, too hard, really, too hard, really, too hard, really, and you win. No, you don't. You know, because he was he basically, you know, uh, you know, at this kind of nice graph, which is from, from this paper. You know, this is the kind of scalability, right? Just say, which, which, is, which system is better, A or B? I say, okay, A scale best, better, right? Just, okay, this is nice, so this kind of stops and you know, tail off. But if you look at, you know, kind of the, the absolute times, then system B is always faster, right? This, again, this kind of contraintuitive things. And this, this last article is basically, you want to distribute, you know, distribute it machine learning, just don't. Well, there are two cases, right? Sometimes you have to, 
and then have to. There is no way around it, right? But, but if you think, okay, it will be faster, no, it won't be faster. Basically, you can buy a big box like one terabyte of RAM and you know whatever, 24, uh, 240 cores, and just run with it. And it, this, this is all caused by the fact that hardware is weird. Hardware is kind of contraintuitive, and there's a lot of, lot of kind of weirdness, a lot of, lot, lot of uh, parallelism, a lot of kind of fast pass and slow pass, and a lot of, you know, there's a lot of execution units, and this is this, this and that. It's, you know, it's kind of, it's weird, and it's kind of contraintuitive. And sometimes it's ex, ex behave, you know, in a bizarre way, and this is actually the, you know, the as well, which is the kind of, uh, almost, I don't know, almost, it's like 2000, what, 12, 2011 CPU from, from Intel. And there's a lot, lot, lot of kind of, lot of parallelism, lot of, lot of good stuff that basically, most of the time, it's not even used, right? Sometimes you use like, whatever, like 5% of your, of, your, of your CPU. And in order to kind of drive this home, I prepared a little quiz. Very simple. Two, two examples. You can, can you see it? No? Okay. Two examples, right? Two, two fragments, left and right. They are doing the same thing, but differently, right? Basically, you want to stay in, in bound of this array, so you basically compute modular length. Length is some sort of, const it's not constant, it's kind of dynamic va variable, but it's, you know, it's, it's power of two. You compute it by modules, and then, <coughs> sorry, then you basically mask the last couple of bits. Which one of these is faster? Right one is fast. It depends on the machine. Depends on machine, okay. This is, this is clever. <laughs> now, this is too clever for this, for this task. And uh, a compiler, yeah. A compiler, you, well, yes, of course. But you know, generally speaking, you, know, you, 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 know, you look at it kind of naive way that you know, somebody said it, that the right one is faster, and it is. Why? Well, because modulus is really, really a slow operation. It can take up to 100 cycles, right? It can be on pipeline, so you, know, you, you multiply at the same time, whatever. You know, but if, if you look at this kind of, you know, just say, okay, there are two operations, whatever, and just, you know, this, one, this, this, this one is faster. Because you know this, this operation is fast, this operation is fast. This is really slow, right? This is kind of again, you, know, you cannot just count instruction. You know, you just have to look at it. What what what, it, what is doing? But it, you know, there's a lot of lot of kind of subtleties that you know basically sometimes you can how is this check up? You know, outside of the loop and stuff like that. Ah, another thing. Very similar code, but you know you have this kind of array. This array. And this array contains the kind of offset of the next next next, next element. Now it's, it's like pointer, right? But yeah, I don't know. I cannot. I, I don't know C, so I can. I don't know how to do you know, pointer. Kind of the same. Th I don't know C. I know. I, well, I know it, but don't. Well, I you know, I said it, but you know, okay. you know my my voice is not too powerful, so it doesn't reach. <laughs> didn't teach. All, all, all the way to the back. But of course, you know, if, if you know, it's just, of course. But the, the, you know, this is, the, this is a very similar case. You have, you basically have this kind of offset, this next element, and there is a series array that you, in such a way that basically kind of sum, sum, sum this stuff up to actually do some work. So, you know, so it, it, it isn't kind of eliminated by your compiler. And then you load this, load this offset and kind of sum it. And it's the next, next iteration, load the offset that you load before, right? So basically, this is, that, that is one, right? So it's next, next, you know, you load one, and in the next iteration, you access array one. And, you know, this, this, this contains two, and next iteration, you load array two, and then go this way, right? And then you wrap, wrap arounds and stuff like that. And in, in this case, it's this kind of direct way, basically accessing like, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and, and such stuff like that. Which one of do, those two is faster? Again, they are doing the same, same amount of work. They lead to same result. Which one is faster? Right, right one? You think right one is faster? Why? Uh, I think because of the Lucas on the last entry of the array. Exactly, exactly. Basically, this iteration has data dependencies. You know, basically, you don't you don't you don't know where do you, wh where where to jump before you load this value, right? You basically, you know, you, you have to load this value before you know where to jump, right? In this case, you jump to the next one, but you know, this this is not this you know, you can be certain about this. But in this case, there, there is no, no no such dependency, right? 
And in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this case, hardware can basically kind of speculate through this loop, right? They basically see this loop, say, okay, I have to do this one, but I, I want to, you know, I need to wait for memory. So what, what do I do now, right? I have you know, with all this, you know, I have all this stuff, and I'm, I'm using like one, one, one whatever, MOF, so I store and load units. One of these, right? All this thing is kind of do, do nothing at all. So hardware basically say, okay, this loop will be, you know, this branch will be taken, so you know, I will execute this, this next iteration of this loop, and speculatively, kind of, you know, he guesses. And most of the time, he's right. Because this loop, you know, iterates through, you know, whatever, and it's maybe, I don't know, billion, and it's always right. And he basically kind of go ahead, you know, go through this loop, and execute multiple iteration, you know, deep. And if it's, if it's, if it's wrong, he has to kind of say, okay, whatever, I was wrong, I have to roll, roll back. But basically this way, he, can, he, he is able to do multiple, multiple operations at the same time. In this case, he has, to, he has to wait, he has to load, and then wait. Which is, you know, if, if you know, if it's in cache, it's fast, fast, you know, it's three cycles, but there you can do multiple at the same time. Which means this one is faster, because there are data dependencies. Ah, so there's, there's, there's an, 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 another one. Co code is completely the same as, as, as the last, last case. Uh, you know, the code, code is the same, only difference is how is this array uh, organized. You know, in, in the first case, you, you do the sequential iteration, one after the other, after the other, and th in the second case, it's completely random iteration. You, see you jump there and there and there and there and back, and you <coughs> you don't know what. And this array is big. It's like whatever big data we have them. This array is big, like uh, what a gigabyte or terabyte. It's it's it's, it's in memory. It's not like paged. Which one is faster? Yeah, you know, again, yeah. this one is faster. Yeah, you're smart. You're a smart crowd. <laughs> You know, you know, you know, um, it's funny faster. You know, again, if you look at it, you know, the code is completely the same, right? You know, it's just like, what should be difference, right? The, the asymptotes, the you know, same thing. You know, this is n, this is this is n. What's the problem? Problem is this that if you are kind of do this do this kind of predictive uh, predictive striding, if you load one and the other and the other and the other, then uh, kind of hardware detects it. Hardware kind of helps you. All these these beastly devices, these beastly. Why is this prefetch? Blah blah blah. blah. Well, some some of this kind of stuff. Well, never mind. One 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 of these units kind of uh, detect this 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 access pattern, and basically fetch the f start fetching this data ahead of time, right? So basically, if you as you say, okay, you know, are you accessing first element, the second, third? Uh, hardware detect. Oh, maybe you need fourth, and you know you you maybe in the future you you want to access fifth, sixth, and la la la. And you kind of prefetch this data from memory, and they are ready. You know, basically, they are, <coughs> they are ready, waiting in cache, you know, to be accessed really, really, really fast. But in this case, how does do nothing? Right? Just you know, access, jump there. Where is this memory in location? Where, where is this location in memory? Somewhere. You know, is it, is it in your cache? No, because it's big data. So basically, you have to access this, mem this memory location, and, and you have to go to memory. And accessing memory is very, very slow. It, it, it could take like current some current hardware is like it's like up to 18 nanoseconds, which means like what, 240 cycles. Which is quite a long time, right? And again, you have this kind of data, data dependencies, so we have to access one location and wait till it's arrived from memory, and then kind of oh, just do nothing at all, and then oh, okay, I access, you know I read pointer there, and then just load it and wait, and you know basically we have to kind of this complete sequential access. And this, this is slow, but how much slow? You know, you just say, okay, it's about, you know, it turns out this is 50 times slower than this bit. And why is this important? Well, you know, you know dependent loads, you know, dependent <coughs> memory, memory loads on arbitrary me memory location, you know, just like, like, well, trees probably. What is used in functional programming a lot? Mm, trees, oh, this might be a problem. You know, of course, you know, but if your data are kind of small and fit inside of your cache, which may be like whatever, up to, well, depends on you know, details. Let's, let's say two megabytes, L3, if it's you know, shared between every core. It's like, you know, it's fast. But if you go overboard and it's, you know, just, you know, just you fall off and it's, it's, it's the difference is quite, quite remarkable. Yeah, should, should go back to the first example. First? Back? Yeah. This one? 
uh, this is this is like ooh, like four times faster than only something like this. No, it's, it's like some, some, you know multi, multi, multiple. It's not like that ten percent. It's just it's, you know if, if, if it was ten percent, just you know, measuring error. I don't, I, don't, I don't even care. But this is like you know this is like four times four, four times slower. But if this one is well, I, actually there there are numbers. This slide that I was was in there was, there was numbers right. There was if you do the sequential pattern, sequential access pattern that you're accessing one after other. But, but are independent, which means there are no data, data, data dependencies between those elements. You can do in whatever 2.4 cycles per iteration, right? If you do, if there are dependencies, it's like twice as slow. If you're accessing random random location, but they are independent, so hardware cannot do multiple fetches from memory in parallel. It's 50 cycles. And if you do random access, and they are dependent, so basically you have to kind of wait for the for the previous one before you can start the current one. It's 262 cycles, and if it's fit in, fit, fit, in, fit in, into your cache, it's you know 1.8 cycles. What's interesting about this this graph, this table, is the difference between these these two numbers, right? So this is the maximum speed, and this, and this is the minimum speed. It's kind of the worst possible case, kind of you know, artificially created, and it's you know, over 100, 100 times slower. Right. And this is a kind of difference between running a co co computer that is from 2015 and 2005, right? Something like this. Maybe not, but. but one interesting point is this one. That hardware can do, in this case, can do four and four and a half instruction per cycle. Basically, it's, it's able to do multiple, multiple instruction at the same time, right? Basically, he find this independent work to do and execute them in parallel. Basically, do it, you know, basically kind of find that this, you know, speculate through these loops and find this, all, this, all this work and do it in parallel. And keep track of everything, and this is quite 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 a good result, right? And this is kind of you know this is this is what I'm talking about, right? It's the difference between between those two cases. And and there's there's another one. This is kind of, this is this one is kind of pretty. We have some 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 struct that has eight fields that have you know so long it's it's eight, eight bytes. At least on, in my computer, on my computer, uh, and then you basically iterate through everything. Iterate through everything, and in this case, you add only one field, and in this case, you you add every every field. So which one is faster? Which one is slower? Yeah, I tweeted this. Did, did, did you did you read when I when I tweeted this? No. Well. The, you know, exactly, it, 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 it is the same speed because you know you are not limited by computation; you are limited by memory throughput. Because you know you can you can like you can push like ten, gig, 10 gigs a second from memory, which mean which mean uh, ten gigs from memory, and memory is kind of uh, managed in little blocks called cache lines, and every cache line has 64 bytes, which is ooh, coincidence, and basically. In every iteration, if you touch this 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 struct, I mean you bring one cache line, right? And in this iteration, you touch everything, you still bring one cache line, right? But if you kind of compute compute the, the rate, and it kind of turns out that you can you can load like 150 million cache line a second, which means like six nanosecond per iteration, which is like 12, 12 cycles. Basically, you have kind of there is kind of window of 12, 12 cycles between between your computation. Before new data arrives, and you can kind of act upon them. And basically, th th this leads to the fact that these, these are the same speed. And if you understand this, this step, you un understand clone databases perfectly, right? Because this is, you know, this is kind of your, your uh, ordinary, you know, row, row databases. You have one row, as, you know, as one chunk. You have to load the whole row. But if, if you kind of split this, it's not, it's, it's, it's not array of structs, but structs of array. And this, this one will be faster because you're accessing only. <coughs> this, this this field and we are not limited by throughput of throughput. Uh, there is another one. I just skip this. And yeah, this is this is this is basically okay. Well, I, I, at least I explain it. In this case, there there is this this this. The main problem in this case is uh, is. Um, Branch prediction, right? Because you have this branch, and hardware basically have to decide because you know you just just do a lot of stuff in, in parallel. Like, you know, it's, it's everything is pipelined, 
<coughs> so in, in the beginning of your pipeline, you have to decide whether or not you take this branch or jump over it, right? But you don't know whether or not this, this condition is evaluated because it's on the, uh, you know, it, it will be evaluated like 15 cycles later. So basically, you have to, you have to decide, and what do, you, what do you do? Well, you can, you can wait, but you know, this means that you lose on every, uh, every, every iteration, you lose, you know, every branch, you lose like 15 cycles. Which, by the way, I think it was like Pentium Pro has a branch predictor that has 5% uh, imprecision. In 5%, it was wrong. And because of this, it lost 30% of performance, right? It is very, very important because, you know, branches are everywhere. And, you know, sometimes, if you, if you, if you, can, if you can predict this branch, it's, it's really, really fast, right? For example, in this case, you know, just say, okay, it's not zero, it's some, some random values, and, you know, almost nothing is, is, is zero, right? You basically, okay, this, this branch will be, every, 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 every time this branch will be taken. In this case, it's, you, know, you know, half, you know, 50% taken, 50% taken, you know, you basically hardware hardware just you know just tossing coins basically. It just doesn't know anything. Like, you know, try one one branch and it's fifty percent of time is wrong and fifty percent fifty percent of time loses. And there are also subtleties like you know you can trans you compile this with conditional moves and whatever. But fun, fun, funny thing is that that this case do twice amount you know twice amount of work than this case, but it's twice as, twi twice as, twice twice as time fast, right? This is kind of weird stuff. And if you, if you want to read about this, there are some, some references. For example, it, 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 this, this, this is such a problem that you have, if, you have, if you have quicksort, but basically quicksort, you have to basically decide, is this, is this element left or right? You have to basically, it's small or getting a pivot. And if you have ideal quicksort, then this, this you know, 50% of time, it go, it go left, 50% of time, it go right. So basically, you just every time you lose, this is this, this case, right? Fifty percent, you lose every every time. So sometimes it's actually better to choose worse pivot, right? This kind of pivot, this is cute. This is kind of you know that you go most of the time you go this way, right? And the result sometimes is faster, sometimes it isn't. But there is a way how to do sorting without branching altogether, right? <laughs> Using some sort of um, you know SIMD instruction, and I see the same thing, SIMD instruction or radix sort. Of course, you know, it's, it's implementation of GPU, itanium, uh, whatever. There's no time for details. So, if your data structure or algorithm, if your <coughs> data structure is small, local, sequential, and predictable, it's very, very good. Hardware basically do everything it can to help you, right? If it's small, it fits, in, fits into your cache, it's fast. If it's local, meaning, you know, you don't have to chase pointers to load everything, it's fast because you know just load, load this load this object, everything is there, right? You don't have to load anything else, basically. It's, it's, it's there in this cache line because you load 64 bytes from your memory. Sequential, again, you know, if, if you're accessing this kind of in sequential way, then uh, hardware basically det detect this kind of access pattern and kind of prefetch data before you, you, you before you need them and eliminate this kind of the surround tip from memory. And predictable if you have these branches that basically go uh, you know way that you ex expect, it's very very fast, right? There is my my blog. There is kind of list of links to uh, to kind of another articles about this this topic. It's kind of like this this long this this, this long, you know, list this long. But you know, this is fast, local, sequential, predictable, and it's good. But in functional programming, it's almost never anything of these four things. Because so we have trees. They are small. No, well, you know, just part of this thing. Local, not not even close. Sequential. No, predictable, no. So, you know, it's kind of, hmm, what are you gonna do? You know, it's basically this kind of, this, this, this uh, fight between asymptotes and constants, right? In, in theory, only asymptotes are what matter, right? If you have constant times, it's faster than everything else, right? But in practice, it's kind of different because, you know, if I go back, if you have logarithm from big number, and it's like, whatever, like, set logarithm of something is 32. And if you have 32 of this speed and a constant of this speed, which are faster, this logarithmic one, right? Which is kind of, uh, and it, it's, it, it, uh, this is one thing that uh, Rob Pike said, that you know, fancy algorithms are slow when n is small. And most of the time, n is small, right? Which probably is not true, but I don't want to mention it. It's, it actually undermine my you know, whole things. But anyway, right? Sometimes you compile, you know, program is O0 and O3. Result is the same because hardware can do this work 
you know, extra work in parallel. Sometimes you, I, I implemented this uh, alternative least square, which is ma ma uh, algorithm for matrix factorization. And by doing more work, basically copying data over, I get four times speed up, which is kind of interesting. You do more work, and in the result, you are faster. Yeah, this, 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 was, this was really funny, because there was a paper published, uh, some Haskell guys published this kind of state-of-the-art algorithm for uh, nearest, nearest neighbors, right? Have, you know, points, and what, what, what other points is you know, closest to this one? And they use some clever algorithm, like cover trees and stuff like that. And they reported, reported this, this result and said it's better than everything else. And I kind of sit down and in one evening implemented a naive version in C. It was faster than this, 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 this kind of state of the art everything, right? Because it was kind of, it uses SIMD, SIMD instruction that if you're you know, doing a lot of work in parallel and you are using uh, kind of efficient cache layouts that basically you, ne you never kind of, you know, never go to memory because everything is kind of streamlined and nice. It was like twice as fast than, you know, the naive version was twice as fast as this kind of clever version there. Because, you know, you know the, 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 the cover tree basically need, you know, they, have this, they are not local, they are unpredictable, basically they wasted like 50% of cycles doing nothing because waiting for memory, waiting for memory. Oh, uh, yeah, that's like, oh yeah, this, this one is kind of, uh, I was kind of experimenting with um, the hash function for PHP. For example, this was, this was kind of weird thing that I wrote the PHP hash function for PHP. It was more stupid, more you know, worse. It was kind of doing more work, but kind of faster, because it has more independent operation. Basically, everything was independent, and kind of hardware kind of you know start doing that, that thing, and it was fun. And you know, Radix is fast and just kind of do everything up. And sometimes uh, log square is faster than log. And as somebody somebody reported that. Uh, by using this, this collection, which is the Scala uh, primitive mutable collection, they speed up some Spark job by six and a half, half time. So again, you know, just kind of nice, kind of compact stuff, and using it, and boom. Which are not, not you know, not numbers that are too, too, too bad. And this is, I skip this. So what I'm saying, you should know your hardware. And it's kind of weird stuff, and. And sometimes, you know, just forking money to Amazon is not the way to go. Uh, but now, back to the topic, right? I was talking about something about functional programming. It was this kind of detours to hardware. And, you know, we all know functional programming, right? It's great. It's all this nice thing like differential transparency, you know, equational reasoning, immutability, most of the time, you know, laziness, sometimes. It's kind of good stuff that we kind of, you know, you know I mean, like, for example, F sharp is not like this. Yeah. Stuff like that. <coughs> There's this kind of this, uh, this essay about wh wh why it's good, because laziness kind of, you know, decouple consumer from producer from con consumers. They kind of, you know, have this kind of one level kind of deta detachment, and it increases composability and stuff like this. It's kind of nice to kind of, you know, with better, you know, reasoning about stuff that are non-mutable, but are they fast, right? Because, you know, functional programming are using persistence and structural sharing. Basically, if you have, in purely functional persistence, if you have some data structure and do some changes, you never mutate the other one, the old, the old version. You create a new, new one by copying paths from leaf to root, right? For example, this, is, this one is the, you know, this is the old tree, and you change this, this, this node there. <coughs> So the old tree is intact, which is good. And you, you copy this, this bit from there to there. But this again, right, this, this green bit is shared between those two trees. And you have kind of stable view of this, this one, a stable, stable view of this, this one. Right? Which is this kind of classical, uh, fu fully, per, fully fu functional, uh, functional and fully persistent structures. Which is kind of good. This is, this is what was Okasaki was talking about this book. If you didn't read this book, read it, it's great. It's kind of mind, every chapter is mind-blowing. Uh, and there, there are some, 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 some links about, about persistence, because this is not only, only persistence that is possible, right? There's another persistence, which is not functional persistence. And basically, this other f persistence, which is you know, partial and full, allows kind of changes in this tree, right? But you have still kind of this, uh, still, 
still, still this view of every, every version is preserved, but you cannot allow to do changes in there. And if you use this technique from, from this paper, you can make vectors that are, you know, Scala closure vectors that are like many times faster, cheaper updates, faster, faster searches. <coughs> but you know, what is bad about this stuff, right? Because you just say, okay, if you update, what is cost of the, this update, right? It's, it's logarithmic. You have to do logarithmic about a word because you, co you need to copy uh, number of nodes that is, you know, proportional to depth of the sea, right? So this three have co how, how much? Like 16, 16 nodes, 15 nodes, so you have to copy four, right? Which means you have to do some, some extra allocation, right? So you, just say, you might say allocation, it's, it's no problem, right? JVM is very, very good about allocation, right? Allocations, allocations are cheap. Well, it's, it, it's true, but not so much. And this is not in the next slide. <coughs> right, because a because lot, lot of the time, the functional code that is really nice is not really, really efficient, right? For example, you might, you might write something like this, right? This is some numbers from one to 10, some numbers from one to 10, you know, well, done, right? It's kind of, this code is kind of relatively nice. Well, there are probably functions some, but you know, let's, let's ignore it. Uh, it's a kind of Haskell stuff, or at least I was told it's Haskell. Uh, Right, but, but you know, you should, if you look at it and evaluate it in a naive way, that you have to allocate this list of numbers and then kind of reduce them and allocating, you know, kind of these intermediate values that are immediately deleted and, you know, kind of fold to this, this value. And so same, same, same thing here, right? If you have like, if you have some collection XS and mapping it by function G and then it produces list and, map, and then you map it by F, again, it's kind of, Produces another list, and this this list, this intermediate list, is not necessary, right? So you know, it's, even if allocation is cheap, it's kind of best to best to um, get rid of it. And there are techniques how to kind of eliminate it in a kind of principled way. <coughs> Sorry. Like deforestation, deforestation and stream fusion, which is basically, uh, for example, in this paper. Uh, this thesis, and in the beginning, um, the, the, the author, uh, authors describe um, how it's used in, used in Haskell. Haskell basically has these rules, kind of these uh, right, right rules that if you have like map f map g, then it's described to map f compose g and stuff like that. And this, this, these are the rules that kind of <coughs> uh, lead to elimination of intermediate steps, right? <coughs> and but sometimes, sometimes it's not possible because. Um, know, <clears throat> you might express your computation as this kind of tree that you kind of reducing in some bizarre way, but kind of this runtime <clears throat> cannot really kind of fold it to loops. And basically this is kind of result of this techniques is something that look like, looks like a loop. <clears throat> JVM uses uh, escape analysis, which is technique, which is, which is very simple you know, assumption that you have a method <clears throat> and you allocate something in this method and if it never escapes, then it's, it doesn't need to be allocated, right? You allocate it on stack and you are good to go. Uh, I think the escaping is kind of <coughs> tricky because uh, you know object escapes when you return it, then you assign it to another object that escapes. If you assign it to static uh, static field, then it, then it escapes. If you assign it to field of another object, you know basically transitively it's kind of escape. If you assign it to anything, then it's kind of transitively you know can escape. <coughs> can escape. You cannot, cannot really be sure. And if you, have, if you have virtual methods and pass it into virtual methods, right? And the method is not never inline, then you, can, you are never, never sure, right? Which means this escape analysis is very, very conservative. It means you can do anything. Sometimes you can. You know. This is a very simple, simple example. And Azul was a company that was making the, their own hardware. They have basically some support for this kind of stuff in hardware. It's like everything will get on stack, and if it's escape, then kind of, you know. <coughs> It causes it a trap and <coughs> handle this stuff in software. And for example, there's this, this, this article, Apache Kafka, <coughs> which is this kind of uh, messaging, messaging, whatever, framework or what's called, this kind of stuff, messaging, sending messages from A to B and, and back. And they basically speed up compression by 35, 34%. Uh, but not by op optimizing the compression, but the copying, right? Basically, they compress the stuff and then you do like f five copies. And, and you would expect that in, in bit that the compression, the compression will be the, 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 you know, the most expensive bit. 
but it, it turns out that you know the copying stuff <coughs> around was, 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 was quite slow. <coughs> so you know, yeah, so we have to kind of eliminate allocation, but some, sometimes you cannot because you know just you know you create a new version and you cannot you know there's nothing to eliminate, right? You basically you want to access this bit and this bit, <coughs> and you know you cannot kind of you, there's no way to fold it. Even though there was some uh, paper about um, like specialization types, where you basically you have some sort of you know, kind of automatically, for example, <coughs> kind of fold this this bit into kind of you know one type, one kind of you know, homogeneous type that have all these fields in line, but it's kind of you know <coughs> in its infancy. But one problem is allocation is uh, bandwidth, right? Because if you allocate, it means that you have to. Write this, uh, you, know, you basically say, okay, JVM, give me, give me whatever, give me like 64 bytes. So <coughs> JVM has to read the data from memory into your cache, then, then overwrite it by zeros, because it's you know, guaranteed, it's, it's not necessary, you know, given my specification, you know, <coughs> then write your data over, and eventually it's kind of, you know, basically you use this, 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 this item once and kind of never, never touch it again. And eventually it's kind of, you know, evicted from cache and has to be written back to memory, right? Which means that you pay twice for every allocation, right? And <coughs> kind of tr your throughput is limited. It's like, you know, several, you know, 10, 20, 30, gigab 30 gigabytes a second, but, it, but, it's, but it's limited. And, <coughs> you know, sometimes it's, for example, better to allocate third local mutable stuff than allocate everything, you know, dynamically, uh, you know, basically just do some work, allocate, allocate new stuff, create it and throw it away. Sometimes you know, allocating third local mutable map can lead to some performance. For example, if you, if you are using al algebraic monoids, which is really nice, nice, nice library for reduction, right? If all this composable stuff, but the allocation is just di diabolical. Because you know, we have some collection of something and you basically, f you basically take the, those, 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 those two objects and you kind of add them together, right? Which allocates a new one, right? And take this, this one and you know, fold it again, allocate a new one. Just go go this way and and now back to data structures. <coughs> you know, if you have these, the kind of complexity, asymptotic complexity is kind of all right. You know, if you have really big T, like you know, like you know, that have like maximum integer number of values, and then <coughs> average depth that you need to go is like thirty, which is <coughs> but <coughs> you know again right. It's all, this, this is dy dynamically allocated uh, chunks in memory. You know, wh where they are, well, they, you know, kind of GC may copy them over because, you know, if you traverse this structure that, you know, for this pointer and this pointer, this pointer, they mean that these three will be kind of next to each other. But if like something like G1, which have these sectors that are allocated concurrently, no chance. You know, it's, it's allocated basically dynamically on heap and basically every disallocation, every this following this reference means you go to memory. Well, well, not not no, you know, it's not necessarily kind of, It's not always true because if you are structured and use it over, over and over again, then the kind of the top of the tree will be in your cache, right? Which cache, whatever L1, L2, L3, L4, in some kind of current <coughs> Intel CPUs. So you know, kind of this will be fast and this will be slow, right? Going, that now depends, you know, how much is you know how big your data structure is. Right? If it's if it's big, if it's small, and kind of you know ends like there. You know, Everything fits in the cache. It's, it's fast, right? It's not like it's not like one memory access is this little multiple one, but it's fast. But if you kind of go deeper and deeper and deeper, it becomes slower, right? And again, you know, this is this is not you know this thing is not, not the only thing that needs to be you know in your memory in your cache because there's another, another data that you need to kind of access. So it's kind of <coughs> not really ideal, right? You just you know if you have some binary search tree that you know which one you you will go, right? You don't know. It's unpredictable. Again, there are data dependency that you need to need to load uh, you know, value of this pointer before you know where to jump, and it's not local because you know, if you are, for example, doing kind of for each traversing over everything that you have to just go you know, this way and this way and this way and just you know, <coughs> just you know, chasing pointers all, all over the place. There are ways how to make this better. For example, cache oblivious data structures like Van and de Bois, Van and de Bois. I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's a pretty cool name. And they basically kind of uh, work like, basically have this kind of encoding of trees that it's not, not, not this naive, but you kind know, of split it in half depths and 
basically lay out this tree in in kind of sequential way and everything there sequential way and they kind of do, do <coughs> there are kind of recurs deeper and deeper. There is this nice way that you if you basically for example <coughs> in this encoding these two three nodes end up in some same location, right? So basically if you access this node, you access this one cache line, this one location, right? Which leads which means that these two are you know ready, ready, ready you know ready on your <coughs> in your cache to be read. Which means you know it'll be faster. And the uh, good thing about this cache oblivious stuff is that it works for any, ca uh, you know, for cache lines of any size, right? It could be 64 bytes, it works for 32 bytes, it works for, for 4K, like, you know, this box, for megabytes, everything. It's ideal, you know, in a kind of asymptotical sense for everything, right? But if you have, if you have some uh, binary, <coughs> binary set, oh, I just I skip this. Yeah, it's already too long. <coughs> now vectors. Vectors are this kind of this wonder child of, of functional programming. Well, they, they were uh, based by uh, based on some papers from Phil Bagwell, but adapted by Reggie Key from Closure Fame. But I think they were implemented by Daniel Spivak from you know Scala Camp. First first implementation was by Spivak. <coughs> Basically, you know, the secret of vectors is they are very very broad, right? They, they have. <coughs> uh, I just in, the, in, in this example, I have kind of the, you know, the width of the tree is four, but in fact, every node has you know 32 elements in vectors, right? Which means that this, these trees are very 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 broad and very very shallow, which is good, because you need to traverse only a limited limited amount of you know limited amount of jumps, right? For example, if you have one million elements, you need only four levels, which is good, right? You know, top will be in a cache, which is good. And the rest kind of, you know, it's, it's not too much, right? It's not, not too much traversing. <coughs> they are kind of saying that they are effectively constant. That's kind of lie because basically it's, it's go, goes, it means basically that logarithm of the, with base 32 from big number is seven, right? Seven at most. You should say, ah, it's constant, don't worry. Right? Which, which is kind of, kind of nice because it's, it's relatively fast. But the problem is that this, these nodes are really big, right? 256 bytes this node, and if you do again, if you do update, you have to copy everything from 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 leaves up to the root. Which means, for example, if you copy like uh, you know this four level tree, if you copy one kilobyte for every update, except we should have this kind of transient stuff, which which kind of kind of partially op uh, do this kind of <coughs> several updates in place and then kind of finalizes <coughs> again, right? which is kind of good and bad. It's, you know, it's not terrible, but it's not. It's not you know, that good, bad. For example, you know, if you do traversing you know, for each, that uh, <coughs> you know, like basically traversing through, through this, this 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 node, and this node is kind of you know linear, so it's sequential. So this is good. But then you kind of you know do 32 iteration, and then you hit speed bump, right? And you find this one, and then you, you know, again you know, spin ahead, and then speed bump, speed bump, spin ahead, speed bump, which is kind of not bad, not but still, for example, if, if you compare vectors against some sort of full data structure like array, they are like four to eight times slower, right? It kind of depends, basically. Number of levels slower. <coughs> uh, for example, uh, I think Clojure uh, have this, this kind of, uh, have basically this kind of append and prepend buffers. Basically, if you, if you append stuff there, then you don't have to copy whole, th you know, whole pass, but basically, you know, shuffle one element in there, which is kind of, which makes, uh, Update cheaper, uh, prepends and append cheaper. But Clojure have this extra note in there that you know this is not array of array of arrays, but array of objects that contains array and contains object that contains array, which is kind of one level in, in direction, which is probably necessary because they use this transient stuff. <coughs> but you know, vectors is kind of nice, but kind of you know you, you can almost believe they are good, but they are not, because you know, sometimes you have some sort of <coughs> You know, performance critical application, and you place vectors in this kind of one, you know, enclosed space, with piece of your program with some, you know, arrays or whatever. You you can gain like twice speed up, three times speed up, right? Depending on details. <coughs> which again, which is actually quite quite quite, me quite measurable. Yeah, <coughs> this is this, this uh, improved version of vectors, which are RB trees, which are actually based on paper from from Bagwell. That, you know, they are work like vectors, 
very similar structure, but they are like on a slightly unbalanced, right? They are not like, you know, pectors are like, you know, you know, Nazi soldiers, you know, marching, you know, 32 apart. This is kind of more slack. You can have like four elements or three or whatever, right? And this leads to that you have, you, you can have, uh, you can do uh, merging in logarithmic time, which is nice, but you need modulus, which we say is not, not so nice. And there are this kind of iteration there and there, and, but nobody uses them, so, you know. There, are one, there, are, there, there is one implementation in Clojure that I don't know, nobody uses this. So, okay, next nice maps. <coughs> So this is not functional data structure, as everybody knows, but everybody knows hash maps, right? <coughs> hash maps offer, offer basically constant access time, update and in, in, insert, update, delete, and access for the T operation in, <coughs> in constant time. But <coughs> basically they are, they are, they, uh, they are based on this property of pseudo-random pseudo number generator, basically. Like the hash function basically maps some key to basically arbitrary position, right? You, you can predict this. There are you know, no visible correlations, which means that it leads to, again, leads to this kind of unpredictable memory access. If you have a hash map that accessing, <laughs> accessing element, you know, element number one, will keep accessing whatever, key one, and then key two, and one will, will may be there, key may be there, uh, two may be there, three, three may be there, there's no kind of correlation, right? Again, <coughs> unpredictable access patterns. And on Java or other languages that, that don't have any reasonable specialization, so basically you need to implement this kind of, in this very inefficient way, right? basically array that leads to this bucket that contains pointer to value and key. You see, you know, in Java, in, on JVM, if it's, you know, integer then it's box, which is object, and this kind of this pointer to next uh, bucket in this chain, chain which means you, know, you, know, you want to access this, 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 th this thing, right? So basically you have to access this bit, so one cache miss, third bit, the second bit, another cache miss, and key, another cache miss, right? Which is not very good, right? It's, it's kind of T dependent <coughs> cache misses. But if you have, uh, if Java had um, you know, specialization or verified generic stuff like that, they can basically Take all this stuff, inline it there. They, you would need only one, one memory access, which, which would be very efficient. Uh, <coughs> there are some papers that co compare this kind of stuff. This, this hash map that, that, that needs only one access to, access to one piece of memory are faster than, the, than those that need, need two and three. It's a bit. Uh, now, <coughs> now, how? How do you implement hash maps in functional, you know, purely functional hash maps? Right? Because you cannot implement it this way, because you know, you, have, you cannot you cannot change anything. So you have to copy this thing over, and this this thing may be big. So you know, it's, it's not possible. The way how to go is uh, have this layout that is very similar to vectors, right? Again, you have this kind of this nodes that have <coughs> 32 elements and that points to other, another nodes and other, another nodes, and the last. Last, last level, <coughs> hold pointers to uh, that, that, to key and, key and values, right? Which is which is like like vectors. You get, again, you have to kind of traverse this ar arbitrary, you know, several uh, unpredictable memory locations. But in the end, you have to again and again, right? It's just kind of uh, it's almost terrible. <coughs> but one good thing about this kind of layout is that. The resizes are cheap, basically. You never pay, you know, you, do, you don't, if you do a size there, right? You have to copy everything, uh, you know, you know, basically allocate array that is twice as big and, cop, you know, copy everything over, rehash it, which, you know, which is, even though it's, it's, it's uh, amortized over this kind of multiple operations, but still it's kind of a uh, hit. <coughs> but there, there's, you know, never, you know, you never pay, never pay this kind of expensive operation because, you know, you, you need to add some add something. You basically you know, add, add it there, and if this is f full, then you know, create a new node that and copy this, this two, you know, this two thing in in there. And if this is filled, then you know, go de deeper and deeper. You know, again, you know, like on, you know, top of the tree can be in your cache, but then you go to memory, which is arbitrary location, arbitrary locations again, 
and it go even two levels deeper, which is arbitrary location, which is fun, which leads to this kind of <coughs> not very, not very nice access pattern. But uh, it turns out because it has this kind of random distribution that these arrays are really tiny because you, you don't have to allocate 32. You allocate basically what, what you need. So you have this lots of these tiny objects that are kind of lay, lay, laying around. And kind of garbage collectors doesn't, you know, like it. Basically, you know, <coughs> reclaiming this, this thing is, is easy. You know, so it's like, okay, it's dead. But there you have to basically traverse everything, every these tiny objects and see whether or not they are dead. <coughs> there are these two papers from Bugbell, which, which kind of started it all. They are actually not about persistent stuff. It's kind of, it's precursor for it. It's just this kind of, uh, so not, 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 they are not hash array map ties, but compressed map ties and array whatever. And in Scala, there, there's, there is one, one thing that is kind of interesting. Is this, for example, for small maps, if you have map like one to four, you don't, you, don't basically, you, do, you don't use this kind of mechanism, right? You basically have objects that have two fields, key value. And there you have objects that have, that have four fields, key value, key one, value one, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> which, you, which kind of act like map, but are a very compact, very nice, small data structure. Which seems kind of like a good idea, but it turns out that JVM and JIT and you know this kind of stuff doesn't really like it, right? Because um, if, you, if you call from one, mem one, one, uh, one place, you call method on this kind of stuff, on vectors or whatever maps, then <coughs> kind of uh, JVM can inline it, inline this stuff completely perfectly. Because you call only one thing, right? Like, okay, from this, pla this place, you call in this method right? and just bring it there, inline it there, specialize it. But if you from <coughs> one place you call, you know, this general map and you call or, or this, or this, or this, or this, you know, J JVM doesn't know and you know, fall back to this general, uh, general virtual method dispatch, which is, which is slow. Because optimization, uh, inlining is the most important optimization of, of them all. So that, yeah, one thing, I, I, I'm not completely sure about this, but closure advocates using like, they saying, okay, we don't need objects, objects are stupid, silly. We only need, we basically need <coughs> vectors and maps and sets, right? Because, okay, we don't, we don't use object, we, we use, we, it's the object, we use sets. We, we use maps, right? Which mean these things. Which is kind of, mm. I, for example, I tested this, <coughs> and if you have you know, objects with kind of f fields in them and compare it with uh, object represented as this way, this, this way is like 20 times slower, which is, oh, well, this is your choice. Uh, <coughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's we are almost there. I'm not finished. <coughs> now, you know, this was kind of functional programming, right? I just, I don't want to end this kind of, on this note that everything is bad and, you know, everything sucks and we have to kind of live with it. But some sort of, <coughs> some sort of positive vibes. There are a lot of kind of, I don't know, papers and articles about uh, data structures that using functional principles on you know, in a way that is not that are not completely obvious, right? They are kind of yeah, look at this as, it's, it's not functional, but they are kind of this functional core in in, in certain ways, right? For example, there was this <coughs> snap queues, log free queues with constant time snapshots, right? Which is mutable queue, which you know you can basically you know whatever whatever operation of queues, you put something there and take you back. Th that is mutable. But fun thing about this, this you know, funny thing is that this structure internally uses this, this, this persistent data structure, right? There are this, this, this is mutable, this is mutable, but this is kind of immutable. This is the persistent structure that are mutable. But they are not used to hold the element itself, the kind of the, but they are ho holding these kind of these buffers, right? For example, you put an element uh, stuff there, this buffer, you fill, fill it, uh, if it's filled, you basically you know, hand, it, hand it over in this structure, that, which is effectively mutable, right? Which means everything is there, it's immutable, effectively. So that means that you can do constant time snapshots, right? Basically, you freeze this bit, freeze this bit, freeze this bit, copy this over, copy this over, freeze this, freeze this, done, right? Which is constant time. You don't have to traverse this stuff. There might be, you know, billion element, you don't care. Which again, you, know, you use kind of combination of uh, functional stuff, it's immutable stuff, and nicely meld it together and have, some, have some, some, something interesting, which is interesting and fast. For example, they tested it with, uh, you know, compared it with uh, Java Util concurrent, whatever queues, and they concluded it sometimes it's faster. But the funny, funny is, uh, you know, the, the explanation is funny because 
Maybe he said, okay, our implementation is not so good, not so good, so it's slower. That means that basically the consumers lag behind uh, producers. That means that there are never contention that in the, in the kind of, in, and you know, as a result of this, we are faster. Because we are slower, that means we are faster. It's a kind of fun thing. And there are other, other, other paper, this bit. They basically use a very similar approach, uh, again, basically for, um, well, basically, this explain the, how this is implemented. It's kind of trees that have uh, constant time uh, merging of trees. Constant time, uh, it's called merge, union, whatever. And again, basically, using this, this tree that, have, that don't have that don't hold uh, elements itself, but it's kind of little little chunks. And those chunks basically make this. You know, we have the kind of trees, and, and there is you have this tree. This looks like, like this, more, more or less. But you know, the last level is this kind of this long, you know, long array, right? Which means Right there, you have this kind of niceties of functional programming, and right there, on this, you know, the lowest level, you have this really fast kind of hardware-friendly, friendly structures, right? It's a kind of nice kind of combination. Uh, <coughs> Another thing is um, which I found was like kind of one year ago, two years ago. Well, whatever. Was well, this new version of B trees called B B BW trees? You basically, you know, if you have basically B, B trees that you have these kind of pages and you do in place updates, right? But if you have in place updates, you have to do some locking and some, you know, whatever latching and stuff like that <coughs> to prevent, you know, uh, prevent some sort of races and collisions and inconsistencies. And also, if you do update there and some other CPU has this piece of memory in its cache, then, you have, then basically you do so modification there so everybody has to evict it. So we're reducing the efficiency of, of cache subsystem. Which is again this kind of thing that you don't really think about, but you know you, you may have some hot pages that modify you know quite often and almost you know every every update basically evict uh, this piece of data from everybody else's caches. Uh, so they propose this the solution that they have this page which is immutable, and they prepend this delta, this, this uh, linked list of deltas, and they this this uh, compare this which is atomic operation they can basically swap this swap this uh, you know. It was the original version that I saw, saw this there, you know, atomically. So we have this consistency. You don't have to look, you don't have to do locking, because you know you, every time this is kind of stable view, stable view. But and you have this kind of nice uh, you know hardware friendliness with regard to caches. But if you have uh, you know some sort of multi steps operations, then it's kind of this nasty st states uh, you know nasty states uh, transitions. I right? one you can sub this bit and. Somebody can see this operation in kind of you know in 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 progress, so you know somebody see it and, and fix it. And but it's doable and it's quite fast. It's quite nice. Again, you know, just this immutable immutable data structures, and it leads to you know better concurrency, easy concurrency. Anyway, um, and let's worry. Git is of course is immutable, right? Everything you push to Git tree is there forever, until uh, unless you do you know GGC, which kind of you know clear the old crap. Now again, it's nice, nice. CouchDB, this database that was you know popular like whatever a couple of years ago. <coughs> they basically using this log, log format that uh, if you do some change, for example, you know, imagine that this is the current uh, head of the slog, right? And if you push a new document, then you you know, in that new document, you know, in the end, you know, after the end, you know, current end of the database. And then you basically copy these uh, nodes of this B3, right? Which again, you do pass copy of your B3. And this is root, and this is kind of all your changes, right? So basically, if some uh, another thread accessing the old, you know, old version, which basically is pointing there, there is, there, there is another root, the old one. It has, co it has completely complete uh, and stable view of the of your database, right? <clears throat> but if you, if you have this bit, then you see new one because you see, you know, the kind of new version. And it's very, very good because uh, you know you write to disk in this very lin linear way. You don't have to you know seek and you know, whatever. You know, e writing to SSD is faster than you know writing sequential writing to SSD is faster than kind of random writes, somewhat. And but you have to do garbage collection on on disk. But if you have an, uh, every possible you know 
if you have a system that basically is this for the, uh, lock format, for, for example, for file systems, you, st you still need to do the garbage collection. So, you know, so you cannot win. There is a described in, 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 this, in this post. Which is again, you know, is again same, same thing, right? Uh, you have this kind of stable view, but there it's used, for example, for, for, you know, not, not for it, uh, for the persistence, right? The older version are eventually kind of, you know, compacted and, you know, thrown away. But it's, you know, basically if uh, you, you can do easy replication, right? Just copy data, copy, copy your uh, file, kind of the snapshot, and boom, it's done. <clears throat> you know, if you have some corruption there, then you kind of go back and find the, you know, uh, current root, and everything else is, you know, everything back is, you know, stable, unless we have some bit rot, but we don't have bit rot, right? And it's used from other places like level DB, which is again log based, log -based uh, storage that basically this kind of sorted amounts of data that, <coughs> that are uh, immutable, sorted and immutable. Uh, and if you basically do updates then you can accumulate them and then merge them, again creating new immutable version data, which, which leads to nice uh, concurrency because you don't have to worry. Only thing that changes is this uh, you know, set of uh, current files, right? You create a new one and you just say, okay, there's a new, new file. So this is only concurrent stuff. You don't have to worry about updating uh, these segments, you know, on fly and locking and stuff like that. <coughs> Lucene uses, uses the same thing. If you indexing, then you're creating these immutable segments that you're kind of eventually merging, creating new, uh, new immutable segments, stuff like that. Do it IO then do it, do it IO has this view of you know, temporal view that you know time is marching forwards and you know, you know <coughs> everything that happens in past is stable and fixed. Uh, and immutable, of course. Mono DB. And was of same thing there. There are some links. For now, this is kind of kind of interesting. It's an interesting reading. This is like file system, you know, file system based on logs and for, for SSDs and well, not for SSDs. They are they are they are basically log by log log structured file system is in F SSD and use it, use it kind of as kind of you know in your file system accessing this file system right you know two levels is just I think it's fun. Well, other things and kind of ultimate irony of, of it all is the fact that a lot of these things are inside of your, your CPU, right? Because I, as, I, as I was mentioning that uh, this, um, this, this speculation, right? Basically, you start there and just say, okay, what I would do now? I have some, you know, some spare time. So you start speculating. So basically, you ex execute something that may not, you know, be, may not be necessary. So you have to, you, have, you, you need ability, you know, CPU need, need, need to have ability to roll back, right? Basically, it keeps the old registers and the new registers you know, around, and basically creating these copies that are not, not mutable but kind of you know stable there and live for, for a long time. And if this new version turns out it's, it's, it's valid, then you basically throw the so, throw the old. If it's the other way around, you throw the throw the new, and that's it. Well, and there are some slightly broken kernels, but I skip this. And that's all. It was the second part of this presentation. Oh. That's it.